Ladies and gentlemen, good Monday to you and welcome to another edition of Believe in Saints. He is Terrence Copper. I am David Grubb and uh, doing it again. Three weeks in a row. The New Orleans Saints victorious on the road against a team that they should, you know, on paper should not have beaten. But they go to Philly, a place that they have not done well in, in the past. And they go out and they beat the number one team in the NFC, and backup or no backup. And you go out and you double up Philly in Philly, 20 to 10. It was an impressive night, uh, afternoon for the Saints. Yes, it was. And, man, I just wish that we would have started this maybe two weeks ago. If we would have started this run two weeks ago, man, we would have been in the playoffs. I feel like this team is starting to play the way we thought they could play at the beginning of the year. Uh, they're, I think they're coming into their own right now, and they're confident. I think they're confident in how they're playing. I think the biggest thing to me is defensively, and we've talked about this, I think, the whole season, is defensively, generally, they've been consistent, generally. Um, outside of the big problem the first half of the season of giving up the chunk plays, um, when they were just giving up big plays every game, four, five, six big plays they el- they have eliminated that for the most part in the second half of the season and they've held teams in that 20 point area 20 13 to 20 it seems like every week the defense is right in that area mm-hmm. so consistency for the defense though yesterday i think the biggest thing yesterday is that we saw some big plays out of the defense particularly with the marshall and Lattimore interception which we talk about the first interception by corner all season this team just didn't make big plays defensively. The problem for this team has been offense all season, generating points. What we saw yesterday early was the same thing again that we've talked about. And this is the part that frustrates, I think, people like you and me. Because even when you look at these things, you know the talent. The things that we talked about all season, utilizing Taysom Hill early, giving him opportunities to make plays, which he did with his legs and his arm. He was accurate in the opportunities they gave him to throw. He was effective when they gave him chances to run. They made plays downfield on occasion. Outside of Andy, because we can get into Andy in a minute, but the things that you incorporated to help Andy, Shahid making big plays down the field, again, all those things, giving him multiple opportunities where they were only giving him one at the beginning of the season when he first came around. Those things that we had seen, like you said, that you wish you would have seen maybe a couple of weeks earlier, that's still, like... I think that's the part that hurts is when you're watching those games, you see it. It's just a little more Taysom. It's just, a, you know, extend one or two more drives. You pick up one more big play. It felt, it feels like those little adjustments, it took too long for the offensive side of the staff to come around to. Yeah. And I, I just don't think they realize how vital of a player Taysom Hill is when it comes to that offense. Uh, I think they understand it, but I don't think they understand it to the extent of uh, he has to get touches. Uh, Alvin has to get touches. And honestly, I love the way, one thing I love about uh, about the Saints with this game right here, we came out and we hit them in the mouth. We hit the Eagles in the mouth early. Second half, the Eagles came out and they hit us in the mouth. But we made the proper adjustments, you know, to keep the ball rolling, to, to stay ahead. You know, so I love the way we made the adjustments after they made adjustments after halftime because you understand they're going to make adjustments after halftime, but the way that we continue to adjust after their adjustment and we're just taking the things that they're giving us when it comes to the past, just taking what they're giving us, you know, uh, running some Dalton, running some uh, Alvin, uh, getting the passes, some, some easy passes that are giving you that, that is open, you know? So I love the way that we wasn't trying to do too much. The play call that I love, that I love, it didn't work, but I loved it. It was the flea flicker with mm-hmm. uh, Alvin Kamara with Taysom Hill at the quarterback position. Yeah, well, so, Alvin took the snap and Taysom was at running, yeah, at running back. So I love the fact that you got Alvin and Taysom in and you run a flea flicker with them. I love the thought process on it. It didn't work, but if you're going to run a flea flicker, those are the two guys you're going to run with because all you do is run with those guys with it. You know, so, uh, but I love that play call. Like I said, you got to take your hat off to the coaches. Again, it wasn't perfect, but a win is a win, and we all know wins are hard to come by. And for this team, you know, they, 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 I am not, you know, a lot of people, I had this conversation with folks, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because I think momentum 
is something that we use as a word, but really, I believe it. And you tell me this as a, as a player. I think there are natural ebbs and flows of every season. You know, it's just like in any job. When you go to work on a day-to-day basis, there are days when you're at your best and there are days when you're not. And I think over the course of a game, you know, people say, well, it comes down to this one play. It's never one play. The plays in the first quarter set up the, the plays in the fourth quarter. That last m- minute of the of the game, when you're talking about who's performing in that last minute, is set up because of the other 50 plays that, that went on for the previous, you know, 50 minutes in this game, or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I, I think psychologically, yes, individuals, you can have a time when you're more confident in what you're doing because you're seeing the results. And I think when a team sees that what they're doing as a group collectively starts producing results, you can have good continual progress. That doesn't always necessarily mean you're going to get wins. What the Saints are getting right now is they're not necessarily a better team, I think, than they were a month ago. They're not markedly different as a team. Personnel-wise, they ain't different. They're not executing in a particularly different way. But what they've done is eliminate mistakes, the big mistake that had been killing them. You know, there haven't been the pick sixes. There haven't been the scoop and returns. So what looks like momentum is really just guys getting back to doing what they're supposed to do. They're not making the errors that professionals are, are not supposed to make. And so when you do your job as a professional, what looks like momentum is really just the Saints are doing their jobs. Mm-hmm. And you're hitting it right on the head. It, that was, I think, that was our Achilles heel the entire, shucks, the entire season leading up to probably a few weeks ago. You know, it was the little things, penalties, turnovers. Like you're saying, it's all those things that was keeping us from being the team that we know we should have been this year. Uh, those were the things that was holding us back. Like I said, and you hit it on the head perfectly. The roster hasn't changed. The coaching staff hasn't changed. The quarterbacks hasn't changed. Nothing changed. It's just like you said, they're executing their plays and they're not, they're not turning it over. They're not beating themselves. Uh, so I mean, you're you're right, exactly what you said. Um, yeah, they're they're actually coming together now and they're eliminating those mistakes. I think particularly, I think that pays off for the mentality of the defense more than anybody. Because you saw yesterday the pass rush get to Gardner Minshew. And we have to congratulate Cam Jordan on becoming the Saints' all-time sack leader, passing Ricky Jackson. Now, I got to say this. Ricky is my all-time favorite Saint. I've had the the, the good fortune of meeting Ricky, talking to Ricky. I think Ricky is the greatest Saints player who ever lived, um, just in my estimation. You know, and this is the – that's a personal opinion. I'm not going to argue with people who love Drew Brees or Deuce or Archie, whoever. Ricky's my guy. But if anybody in the Saints organization, if any defensive player since Ricky was going to be the one to break Ricky's record, I think most Saints fans would agree you'd want it to be Cam Jordan because nobody has embodied being a New Orleans Saint. And he's done it his entire career. Nobody's loved the city, the franchise, and it's just showed up every day to do his job better than Cam Jordan has over his career with the Saints. Nobody's done it better. There, you could argue there have been more talented guys, more heralded guys, but as far as just date, year-to-year consistency, being the leader that you need, and the, and the guy who produces at an all-pro level, Cam Jordan has been a phenomenal player for the Saints, and I'm not. it's not something new for me to say that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you got to take your hat off to him. I and mean, like I said, not just the stuff he does on the field, his leadership and his his ability to play, but the things he's done out in the community. You know, so like he's definitely deserving of this. Uh, he's put the work in. Uh, and like I said, you got to take his hat off. You got to take your hat off to him because of the things that he's done his entire career uh, when it comes to being a saint and the things he's done out in the community in New Orleans. You know, so you definitely take your hat off to him and congratulations to him. Definitely. Well, do you have any uh, good cam stories from your time uh, with the Saints. I don't. I didn't play with Cam. He you he left. He got in right after you left, right? Got it after I left. Yeah, that's right. You got in right after yep. you left. Mm-hmm. That's right. But yes, you you only saw to. against him, and you didn't have to deal with him because he's on the D line. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just I you know obviously next stop for Cam after he leaves the Saints is the Hall of Fame. That dude's going to. Definitely. First ballot, hands down. You got to belongs there. 
and just just a guy again consistency at the highest level you know he reminds me a lot of like when you talk about the all-time guys um like the Chris Dolmans um you know those defensive ends Kevin Green you know guys who mm-hmm. did it for a long long time and, yep. and I thought one of the things that was really interesting about Cam was he said y'all can talk about these sacks too but don't nobody run to my side either and for a pass rusher <laughs> to take pride in that and being a run stopper for a guy with 115 plus sacks in his career to also make sure that he mentions that I can stop this run game too. I thought, Mm -hmm. again, that talks about that's team because most Mm -hmm. guys just want to talk about on the ends. They want to talk about, I racked up these sacks. No, Mm -hmm. I do the dirty work too. I do the dirty work too. And that that's what you want. And that's been a football player. You know, if you, if you're a DN or if you're on a D line, it's not just your job to sack the quarterback. You know, that is your job, again, to stop the run uh, different times. And when it's time to, to kind of eat up some blocks for your linebackers, that's part of it, too. You know, so to me, I think he's just being a football player, not pigeonholing himself to a pass rusher. That that's all I do is just rush the quarterback. You know, so he's he's treating himself and he looks as himself as a football player. You know, I can I can brush the passer and I can stop the run. That is their job on that D line. Man, just so much credit for the defense. They did an outstanding job on the field, getting off on third downs. They held Philly, I think, the 25% conversions on third downs. Um, they did a great job in handling uh, the run game for Philly, which had been, you know, we've seen Philly run for 200-plus yards against the Saints before. And they hold Philly to 67 rushing yards. That's phenomenal. You mm-hmm. get back, and then, of course, you get back Marshawn Lattimore, and at the most important part of the game, when you're hanging on to this lead and you got the Eagles pinned back, what people and I—I I, I don't know if everybody knows this—that play was set up earlier because Gardner Minshew had made a similar throw to that earlier in the game, and on mm-hmm. that second time he did it, Marshawn jumped it because he knew it was coming and was able mm-hmm. to get that that pick six. You know, and that's what that's what happens when you get your playmakers back. Uh, we've been missing him all year, you know. So the fact that we got him back. And for him to make a play the way he did, and he's a Pro Bowl corner, you know. So you expect things like that, but those are things we was missing. We was missing that type of play, those type of plays. Uh, so it was just great to see him back on the field and to have him back out. That I'm quite sure in that secondary, it boosted their confidence to have another playmaker out there as well. Let's go to the offensive side, and we talked about this a little bit, but let's get really deep into it. Thirty carries combined between Kamara and Hill. And they produced over 111 yards, uh, 110 yards, excuse me, together. Um, is it, no, 120, excuse me. So, I mean, those two guys go off with those carries. Then you get Taysom going two for two passing. Um, you know, Andy took a few sacks that probably shouldn't have taken, but uh, still, conversions on third down, almost 50% for the Saints. Offensively, that's big. And we talked about, again, we continue to see late in the season, Rashid Shaheed with big plays, and Jawan Johnson, who outside of one drop, that one drop that I know he wishes he had back because it's an easy catch, but Mm -hmm. Jawan Johnson is emerging as a legitimate, like, I mean, you know, one of those hybrid blocking, receiving tight ends that everybody, that every quarterback wants to have as their best friend. You know, when you have guys like Alvin and and Hill, and then you have three receivers out there, like I said, kind of emerging and becoming the, into their own uh, with Shahid, with Olave, and with Johnson as well. You know, with those three guys, I think we talked about it before in another episode, our receiver room, our our receivers are in good hands. I think we have a great group of receivers coming up, uh, and we got some veteran receivers as well. So those three guys have really showed up for us this year. I think offensively we did a great job, with, like you said, when it comes to sustaining drives, uh, get, picking up those first downs. Uh, like I said, we gave up a, we gave up some sacks. A couple of those sacks, I feel like, was coverage sacks, not necessarily on the O line, but we get we gave up too many sacks. Honest, just to be honest with you, we gave up too many sacks. But the offense still figured it out, and and the way they're using Taysom Hill and the Alvin together, I think that is the road that we take. I mean, we only got one more game left, but I feel like that was the blueprint of how to use that offense. And, and at the end of the day, you know, you have a lot of, you have some new guys on the team, uh, whether it's defense, whether it's offense, 
And I feel like as a as a unit, we just kind of figured out how to come together as a team and and to build as a team. Uh, Because at the end of the day, each year is a new year. Even though we go into a year thinking, oh, we got this guy, we got that guy, oh, we about to dominate. But you still have to be able to gel together. You still have to be able to play as a team. All those little things that that you have to do to win still has to be in play. You know, so uh, I think now we're starting to figure it out as a team. I think the offensive coordinator is figuring out what 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 we do well as a team. I think defense coordinator has kind of already figured it out. But I just feel like as a team, we're starting to gel together and the coaching staff is starting to gel together. I think the coaches staff is starting to understand what makes them go and what they're good at. Yeah, I think that as, we, you know, week 17, I think the question for the Saints is really about, you know, obviously you want to close the season with a win um, mm-hmm. and you get to you can get to 500 in the division, but you don't you know, you never want to finish below 500 in the division. So you could close that out and be at three and three, which would feel, you know, you earned, you, you know, sweep Atlanta, get a split with Carolina and you, you lost two to Tampa. OK, Um but I think it's it's like you said, I think what we've learned, this has been much more about learning the last month than about really competing for the playoffs. The play these were playoff games and you had a chance, but the odds were so remote. So what did you learn about your players? Because this is the offseason and we have to start talking about it now because the offseason really begins now. The play- season is, you know, you're eliminated for the playoffs. The offseason is going to be about deciding what the direction of this franchise is, because there's a weird position. You have some really talented young players who started to emerge this season, and guys like and, and guys who are in their the, the early parts, not you know not the rookies, but like a guy like a Pete Werner, who in year three now is becoming a viable Pro Bowl contending type linebacker. So you've got these young guys coming up. You also have the Cam Jordans on the back end of their career, the Ty, Tyron Matthews on the back ends of their career, and you're going to have to make a decision in this offseason as the you have good pieces in this defense, but do they all fit? Does Demario Davis fit your long-term plan now, even though he's still a great player? And I think on the offensive end, you're going to ask those same questions when we talk about this line, because the line still has to be rebuilt in some ways. Who's staying? Is it Andrews Pete going to be around? Is, you know, how, what are you going to do with these extensions for some of these guys who are coming up? You, like you said, you've got a lot of options in the receiver room. The Alvin Kamara question, I think, is a big question because do you think like your Carolina and say, we have this great back, but we don't, we're not necessarily have the pieces to complement all of his talent right now. These are hard questions the Saints are going to have to ask in the offseason. And I think, you know, there's been some playing around with what some of the schemes are to try to figure out who are these guys that we really want to take deeper looks at and who can be part of our long term plan because. Like you said, every year is different. This year will not be next year. I don't look at the schedule. You know, people already talk about what the schedule is. Those teams on the schedule aren't made yet. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody talks about what your third place, your fourth place schedule is. But we see it right now. They had 12 teams last year that finished 4-1 and in their last five games. 12 teams. Out of those 12 last year, 10 of them made the playoffs. This year, half of those teams are going to miss the playoffs. So it's like, you know, closing doesn't necessarily mean you have a great year, year next year. So, right. I, you know, I want to see what the direction is and what Mickey Loomis and if Dylan Dennis Allen is back and if P. Carmichael is back, what is your direction? Because now you are no longer continuing anything. The Sean Payton stuff is done. There's no continuation. Mm-hmm. Where's the new direction for the New Orleans Saints? Right. And what makes that decision even harder is the fact that they're finishing so strong. So the questions you may had early in the season because we were playing so bad, whether it be about the coaching staff, whether it be about just the team, period, now you kind of second guessing. You know, it's human nature to start second guessing because, okay, this team is becoming the team that we thought we was going to be. Do we break this team up or do we give it another year because they're finishing so strong? It's almost like they're starting to gel together. It's almost like the – when it came to the Miami Dolphins, then the Miami Dolphins fell off late this year. But last year, the Miami Dolphins started out like what, one and seven, one and eight, and they reeled off like eight games in a row. And then when the season picked up this year, they continued to do well until Tua got hurt. Then they started going downhill. But it's almost shaping up like this. It's almost like this year is going to help us for next year because we're trying, we're figuring out who we are 
We're figuring our coaching staff is figuring out certain things. Our players are figuring out certain things. So it's almost to the point to where like, man, so do we hold on to certain people or do we go ahead and let them go? Or so like it's it's a tough, a lot of tough decisions to be made. And by finishing as strong as we're finishing right now, it's making those decisions even tougher compared to if we wasn't finishing that strong. And, you know, we just been playing like crap all year. Some of those decisions would be a lot easier. But the fact that we're finishing the way we are, those decisions going to be tough of who to keep, who not to keep and different things like that. It's going to be tough. Because you have to step back again because they're not, you know, you don't want to judge a team by its highest or its lowest. Mm -hmm. You want to try to find that balance and see what were we really most of the time. And that's, that's what these executives are supposed to do. That's what when we, and you as a, you know, work coming out of college as a player and now being somebody who works with young people, you're showing them, they're looking at your film and they're looking for what you do repeatedly, consistently mm -hmm. throughout the year. It's not your one good game. It's not the game where you put up 200 yards receiving. They want to see what you do in the game where you got three catches for 40 yards. Did you block every play? Did you do all those things? So when the evaluation comes for this team, yeah, I think it, it gets really hard because the complementary pieces is what the decisions are. Like you talk about Miami, they said they looked at their team and they won those eight straight games and said, we need more explosion. Let's go get Tyreek Hill. You know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, you go get your receiver yeah. for, for Kansas City. You say, we need explosive. So you added that. You didn't just run it back because you had eight wins. You saw what mm -hmm. you needed to add. So the big question for the Saints, we know quarterback is still sitting there as a question. What do you do? And so that part is huge, too, because your philosophy offensively is going to hinge around whoever you can put under center. If Andy ends up being the starter next year because you don't pan out and draft a good rookie or get a free agent, that dramatically changes the structure of who you put around him in order to get some success next season because you're running, again, a very conservative offensive game plan if you have to start next year with Andy Dalton as your quarterback. And I think that's the first decision we have to make. Who's going to be the quarterback? What are we going to do? I can say who's going to be the quarterback, but what are we going to do at the quarterback position? I think that's one of the first decisions we have to make. Uh, like you said, do we go into free agency? Uh, do we trade? Do we trade somebody? Do we trade Jameis? You know, to try to pick somebody up. Uh, so it's those questions. That question right there may be the hardest question to answer. Uh, and then you got to look at if we do go in the draft, who's out there that we're going to draft? Do we have anybody that we feel like if we draft now is able to come in and start playing right away, or do we need he need to sit behind somebody for? for a few games until you, how until long you, is that are you talking about a one-year process a two-year process because mm -hmm. you know yeah quarterbacks develop at their own rates and then we have some older quarterbacks coming out in this draft you know like young man at tennessee and and uh stetson bennett at georgia they're older quarterbacks they may be able to get you on the field quicker but their peak may come faster and then i have the long term so it's yeah it's mm -hmm. i don't envy this decision i'm glad i'm not in the front office Exactly. But I'm quite sure, like I said, I, I really trust the front office. I think that whatever decision they make would be the right one. Uh, I think right now where we at as a team, with our confidence, I think the coaching staff, uh, they're, comp they're starting to pick up confidence in their self because at the end of the day, coaches look at themselves in the mirror as well. Like, man, do I got it? Like, am I doing what I need to be doing? So, But the fact they're seeing success in what they're doing – that's giving them confidence as well. So, like I said, we'll see what this season does after the season's over with um, when it comes to the roster and the coaching staff. But that doesn't mean that this next game against Carolina doesn't mean anything. It means everything. It, it absolutely it means, does. Yeah, it means everything. This still is a division opponent. Uh, you still and, – and, and, and you still playing a game of football. Anytime you step on that field, you want to win. You're not just out there just to be out there. You know, it's still a lot of work that goes into preparing for a team uh, during the week. It's a lot of work and nobody goes out into a game expecting to lose or don't care if they lose or not. It's just too hard. It's too hard to prepare to go out there with a, I don't care attitude if we win or lose. It's just too hard. Uh, and plus, I don't think you'd be in the NFL if you had that type of attitude. If you didn't have that pride about yourself, about winning games, you wouldn't be in the NFL. You know, So this game definitely means a lot. And you ain't out there putting your body at risk at half speed. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I, 
any time that I know that I can step on the field of my career could end because I get hit, I can't be playing out of half ass. I got, I got. Right. <laughs> you can't be out there just trying to jake it. Right. You can't do that. <laughs> but you know, the the other thing that I really you know um, liked about this season though is just that a I think you know a lot of people worried about the Chris Olave trade. And it looked like at one point when the Saints were doing really poorly that Philly was going to get a high pick. I think ultimately it's proved to be worth it that at the end of the day, it's going to be a middle of the first round pick. So to get a lava and pinning who has looked okay, who's, you know, now that he's getting on the field, he's looking okay. Um, to get those two in the first round, I don't think you were going to do better than that this no. year. You're not going to do better than a potential offensive rookie of the year and a left tackle who may play for you for the next decade. I don't think you can do better than that. So I think the first round pick, ends up being worth it. And then, like you said, first round quarterbacks in general don't pan out. So I think it actually helps the Saints and it helps the whoever they do draft that quarterback because that pressure will not be on that person as a first round quarterback to come to New Orleans and everybody immediately say, starting from day one, they got to be the next Drew Brees. They better come in here and put up 30. I don't want the rookie quarterback to come in with that kind of pressure because you know that's just not going to, to, to work. But I think mm -hmm. you give it now the situation is I can look around if I'm a rookie and you bring in a rookie quarterback, there's enough talent around that player to create to craft something offensively that even if it's not explosive in year one, she, like we talked about Shahid, Alave, if you can keep Juwan Johnson, who's going to be a free agent and somebody's going to want him. I think somebody's going to offer him some money. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you can keep this receiving core, Michael Thomas can come back healthy. If you can get – if Jarvis Landry decides to come back for another year or you pick up some more people, this can still be a really explosive offense and you have a solid defense. They're not far. But in the NFL, it's not far from going the other direction too. So it's just – True. <laughs> True. And, and honestly, since we put it that way, I think that is even more reason to keep Andy Dalton. I think you keep him – it depends on what his price is. Uh, it depends on what his price is, but I think you keep Andy Dalton just to have that veteran leadership, not saying you keep him to be the, the say all be all starter, right? but he does offense. He does know the offense. He does know how to be a professional because he's been in the league for a while. He's been in different places uh, and he's had success in this league. And I think if you bring in a rookie quarterback, he would be a great person to learn behind. Not saying that Andy Dalton is going to be our future quarterback, right. but bring a rookie in. He's a great person to learn from. Yeah, you're going to learn. I mean, you know, at least you're talking about reading defenses, mm -hmm. taking care of the football, getting in and out of the huddle, understanding systems, all those things, the verbiage of moving on. And like I said, the Saints can't have nine different starting quarterbacks over three seasons. It's just it, do, it's not, it doesn't lead to, to good things. So if you are going to have to deal with some continuity at the position, yeah, I don't – nobody – Eddie Dalton is not going to be the villain in any of this, but he can't be the hero. And that's right. – I, I think that's the hard part is, like, there's nothing that man can do. He – at best, he can give you as a B. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and yesterday he gave you a B kind of performance. It wasn't great. He didn't – you know, he threw a pick, didn't throw any touchdowns, didn't have any really great big plays, but that's what you're going to get at this stage of his career. you got to be happy with that B. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. I agree with it. I agree. <laughs> that, uh, got one more week to go. Carolina coming to town. I think it'll be a good send off um, for the team. I think the crowd is is back into it. The fans are excited again. Um, yeah, they trip. There's a few concern, obviously, with the future, but I think it's going to be a good ending to a regular season that has been extremely difficult. A year that's been really difficult for this franchise, but a, a good way to go out in front of the home crowd. And we'll find out exactly what it looks like later in the week. But I, I think this is going to be a good wrap to the season. I think the Saints will get to eight and nine. I do. I, I believe that as well. And I also think, I think we win this game. I think it'd be a low scoring game. I think we win this game 17-20 Saints. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of running. You know that. You yep. know Carolina <laughs> will put it on the ground 40, 50 times. And the Saints have shown now they're willing to run it 35 to 40 times. So yeah, keep it. But that's we. That's what we have been asking for all season long. Was just minimum, shorten the game, run mm -hmm. the ball, eliminate mistakes, and I, they finally figured that out. Yep.
Yeah. Got to give him the credit. But man, before we go though, I got to get your your thoughts on the college football playoff. I'm going to ask you this. Okay. Was that the wildest semifinal week, you know, weekend that that we've seen since the playoff? Because I thought it was just unbelievable. Michigan TCU was a, a game that I couldn't have predicted it ha- happening that way. You know, Michigan clearly was the better team, but t- they, they didn't they made the mistakes. And TCU able to win and then Ohio State Georgia, man, that that's clutch. Georgia was clutch. Mhm. I felt like going into it, I had I already picked TCU. I picked I picked TCU over Michigan. Uh, I think Georgia will ultimately win the whole thing again. But I picked TCU over Michigan. I felt like TCU was just something about them, that they were just finding ways to make it happen. And that's what they've been doing all year. So this game was no different. Uh, I don't think TCU could beat Ohio State or Georgia, but I felt like Michigan could. But I just felt like t- TCU could beat Michigan. So it was just kind of weird, my thought process on who I felt like to win. But I, I, I felt like TCU could beat Michigan, uh, but I don't think TCU can beat Georgia. I don't think the only only team that could beat Georgia, I felt like, was Michigan. Matchups are everything. Yep. Matchups are everything. And TCU was able to do what nobody else has been able to do against Michigan. They shut down the run game. Mm-hmm. And I, yep. I, I, especially in the red zone. True. Those first three drives in the red zone. TCU's defense made what I thought were the most important three defensive drives in all of college football this season. Because you had mm-hmm. Michigan inside your red zone. Three consecutive possessions to open the game. You turned the ball over. You gave up big plays. And three times they got stops, held Michigan to six points and a turnover. Like that, you can't do any better than that in a big game. You mm-hmm. can't do no better mm-hmm. than that. And honestly, I felt like the first time Michigan got down in the red zone, I felt like they should kick the field goal. The fact they didn't kick the field goal and they got stopped, momentum change right then and there. You know, so I just felt like like the TCU came out and they played the way they the way they've been playing, honestly. The way they've been playing. Uh, I think they proved a lot of people wrong. So I think it's gonna be a great game coming up. But I I, I don't think TCU is good enough to beat Georgia. I think Georgia is just uh, I think they're just a little bit better. That's a lot of men on that Georgia team. <laughs> That's a lot of men. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they were in C.J. Stroud's back pocket a lot. And I mean, like, they were there. They were – that Georgia – that defense is nasty. Woo. <laughs> T.C., man, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, oh. Glad to start the new year with you, brother, as always. And um, we'll do this again real soon this week. All right, man. Sounds good. All right, until the next time, Saints fans, he's Terrence Copper. I'm David Grubb, and this has been Believe in Saints brought to you by betonline.ag. Who that?